Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Remedy Podcast. Today we're here with part two of a series speaking with Dr. Richard Lawhorn, Red, as he's affectionately known, and Dr. Stephen Nadeau. Now, normally, as I said before, I'd have a nice introduction, but I think the topic is so important that I'd like to quickly turn it over to Dr. Lawhorn so he can continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I am a non-clinician patient advocate and data analyst with about 26 years of experience in the general field of uh, chronic pain and addiction. I am considered by some to be a subject matter expert on public policy for the treatment of pain using uh, opioid medications, analgesics. I am also published fairly widely. I have over 200, maybe 250 by now. Uh, papers, articles, interviews, whatever, in a mixture of uh, peer-reviewed medical journals and uh, mass media. And um, I've been collaborating for some years, I think since 2016, with Dr. Nader asked to introduce himself. If you would, uh, Steve. Yes, uh, I'm Steve Nadeau. Uh, I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Florida College of Medicine, and I'm a staff member at the Malcolm Randall VA Medical Center in Gainesville. Uh, my training is as a, a cognitive neuroscientist, and that's where I've done most of my research. Um, but uh, through the course of my practice, beginning in 1982, uh, I've a very large portion of my clinic population has been people in chronic pain. So I've developed an um, enormous amount of clinical experience over the years um, treating those patients, and uh, they've taught me an awful lot over the years, for which I'm extremely grateful. Um, since we had the first reports of the CDC 2016 guidelines, um, in late 2015, um, uh, Red and I have co- formed an amazing collaboration and dug very deep into the the science of uh, opioids and uh, use of opioids in chronic pain. So, hopefully, between us, we bring combined scientific and clinical expertise to the table today. Yes, certainly. And on that note, uh, Dr. Lawhorn, do you want to introduce your paper, uh, discuss the context around it, and maybe we can go piece by piece and identify key salient points that are relevant? One of the really major discussions that's been underway now for some years in medical literature and in the popular literature, unfortunately, because there's a lot in popular literature that's wildly inaccurate, has concerned the question of whether doctors prescribing to their patients have been a primary source of um, addiction or mortality or um, generally bad outcomes with regard to the use of opioid analgesic Uh, prescriptions in management of pain on a routine basis for chronic patients. The literature has been very deeply influenced by people whom I tend to call anti-opioid zealots, and that term is carefully selected because these are people who, at least in some of their published work, clearly seem to be immune to facts and seem to have more value in their own opinions than they do in the scientific data. And I've been looking at the question of do does prescribing actually cause mortality for quite a lot of years? And it turns out that both Steve and I have been looking at the, this issue in, in, in parallel. I've been doing it as a data analyst. He's been doing it as a clinician. And we concluded that basically there's a very good case that says, no, clinicians have never really been at fault for this. And prescription... Uh, analgesics generally are not at fault for our opioid crisis. And we ra- we put that together with uh, da- two data sources in a paper that you, that you Jay, are, are uh, about to publish on Daily Remedy. What we'd like to do today is to go over visually uh, 
the kind of data and evidence that we believe is very pertinent with regard to understanding that the opioid crisis wasn't created by doctors. It wasn't created by medical supply. It wasn't created, indeed, even by the misuse of medical supply. It was created by, instead, and this is a, an issue that I think Stephen will uh, uh, speak to more directly. It was created by the conditions in which people live, and that's sometimes called the socioeconomic determinants of health. The, the opioid crisis in America today is driven by demand. And the data demonstrate to us that it is not driven by prescribing rates. So we'd like to get into descriptions of the data on that. And before we launch into that subject, Steve, is there anything at this stage you'd like to add? No, I think that's good, Brad. Okay. Jay, let's proceed then. Sure. Which article, which uh, figure would you like to begin with? I'd like to start with an article by B. Thomas Carr and uh, Larry Aubrey. Mm -hmm. They did an article in a peer-reviewed journal that's called... Frontiers. Front Frontiers, gotcha. <laughs> Frontiers mm -hmm. in pain research. That's why I'm here. And, yeah, thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> their, their, his art, their article, basically what they did was they downloaded all of the prescribing data that they could get their hands on, and they downloaded all of the mortality data and hospitalization data that they could get their hands on from the U.S. CDC, and from the National Cause of Death database. And they did an analysis on a year-by-year -year basis for the years 2010 to 2019. Now, there are quite a number of, of lines on this chart, so let me try to speak very briefly to what each one of them uh, is all about. The green line is morphine milligram equivalent daily dose per capita. And what we see is that the... Um, MME per capita drops from 800,000 MMED on average down to about 350,000 MMED, 55% between 2010 and 2019. And there are a variety of factors that contribute to that. But we also see total overdose deaths, overdose deaths in which an opioid is implicated as the primary uh, cause of death rising by by basically doubling in in the period uh between 2010 and 2019 we also see that hospitalizations for treatment of opioid toxicity which is the blue line in this chart rises on you know uh, from time to time with some rough spots in it it's not a smooth curve from roughly 10,000 admissions to roughly 50,000 admissions in 2019, and in the two years since, it's risen even further. It's now up in the general vicinity of 90,000 opioid deaths from any source. So what this chart first and immediately tells us is that if uh, opioid prescriptions were supposed to be the problem, this chart says, sorry, guys, no such animal. It's not true because the opioid prescriptions have dropped off significantly, even to the point now where patients are having a very difficult time getting access because of shortages. But the deaths due to opioids, primarily dominated by fentanyl, have avalanched in this last, in the 10-year in, in period treated here. Now, with that said, let's go to a second chart from Howry Jalal and his uh, contemporaries. So give me a moment. And this is a chart when it comes up that gets into many of the details behind the general rise in opioid related mortalities. This chart and a paper was published in a prestigious journal in 2000, I'm going to say 18, um, the journal was Science, and this is a very strongly peer-reviewed journal. And what Howery and I think eight or ten of his associates tried to do was they downloaded from the National Cause of Death 
uh, database and CD and basically CDC Wonder. That's a, a resource that I've used as well. All of the drug-related deaths of all kinds for the period from 1999 to the uh, period 2016. And from other sources, they also looked at the period before 1999. And they asked the question, what is the general overall shape and what is the, what are the contributors to drug-related overdose deaths in which one uh, particular drug or an unknown drug are attributed by county uh, coroners and county medical examiners as the primary cause of death. And you get quite a number of curves here. There are eight different factors in, the, in these curves. Now, one of the things that I'm going to, I want to do for those who are watching this presentation is I want to amplify on the the nature of the individual curves that we see over on the, on the left side of this chart. As I said, prescription opioids are attributed as a primary cause of death um, as one of eight. And the others are respectively uh, heroin, methadone, which is a also an opioid, but it's used in, in uh, treating uh, opioid use disorder. Synthetic opioids, other than methadone, which in both its legal prescription form and its illegal street imported form from various drug cartels. Cocaine is also invol involved in drug related deaths and synthetic, excuse me, and unspecified narcotics of some kind are identified. And methamphetamine is identified, but although it's not, it's not an opioid per se, and unspecified drugs. Basically, some drug was believed to be the cause, but medical examiners weren't too sure what it was. So they, so they uh, indicated that it was an unspecified drug involved in the mortalities that they analyzed. Now, let's look at a particular year, 2010. It turns out this year is um, really quite... <coughs> important because a lot of important things happened in that year that contributed to what followed. In that year and in all the other years, if you add the curves on the left, you get the data points in the curve on the right. So these are exclusive. They don't overlap in this graphical representation. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of uncertainty in this in th this graphical representation. Uh, uh, graphical representation. First of all, because in many cases, more than one of these categories will be involved one way or another in the reported death due to some drug agent. In fact, the dominant mode, the, the usual that we see is that in most cases, uh, when a drug is involved in a death that is analyzed by a county medical examiner, uh, it's usually one of several. And it's often accompanied by alcohol, which is not represented in this chart. So what we what we say is, for instance, in 2010, and let me be sure I've got this right. In 2010, the unspecified narcotics and unspecified drugs of unknown type are something on the order of Three out of 17 deaths, deaths, excuse me, let me make that 2016 because that's where we, we focused in our, um, uh, in our paper. We'll make it 2016, so I beg your pardon to the audience. Now, in 2016, un unspecified narcotics and unspecified drugs of no a type that wasn't known played a role in a major role in 21% of all accidental deaths involving drugs of any kind. That fraction basically reflects uncertainty. And if we put error bars on these individual contributors, what we would see is not individual lines that bounce cleanly up and down between data points. It would be a general curve that probably spreads out a little bit like um, a thick line with uh, some data points above and some data points below.
each of the mortality rates that are quoted in these charts. Uh, however, it is the case that the uncertainty on the part of medical examiners and coroners varies only in a narrow range. It's generally on the order of 20 to 25 percent. Likewise, prescription drugs, as they're marked in this chart, and that would be the blue line that you see running from roughly 0.7 to roughly 3.7 uh, deaths per 100,000. That line is made up of two sources from two sources, and we don't know exactly which one. First of all, you do have some drugs that were either legitimately prescribed by clinicians, and second of all, you have, especially prior to the year 2012, prescriptions that were dispensed through pill mills to street resellers for non-medical use. And we don't absolutely know for sure what the proportion is between the two of those uh, prescription drugs dropped, excuse me, not in this chart, but from the work that we just saw from uh, Aubrey and Carr. The sales of prescription drugs dropped by 25% even as all drug-related mortality increased by 70%. So it seems pretty clear that opioids prescribed by conscientious doctors didn't cause the widely discussed opioid epidemic in that case or in this period. Now, concurrent with closures of pill mills in roughly 2010 to 2012, there was a brief dip in 2010 to 13 in mortality rates that are attributed to prescription drugs. And thereafter, more mortality associated with prescriptions edged upward marginally, and it's continued to. Following the FDA mandated reformulation of oxycodone to abuse resistant forms, that's to say forms that can't be melted down and then injected, not easily anyway, deaths that were attributed to heroin exploded by 400%, even as prescribing of oxycodone dropped. Deaths attributed to synthetic opioids other than methadone, and that by, by that we mean primarily illegal fentanyl sold in the street, increased by over 600%. We see an exponential rise in mortality overall that is attributed primarily to drugs of all kinds. What we don't see in 2016 is a domination of this rise by prescription drugs. In fact, prescription drugs, as I said, are only one of eight contributing factors. And there's a lot of uncertainty even in the exact contributions between each of them. But the rise in uh, deaths that we're seeing generally is can be attributed to street drugs, not to prescription drugs actually dispensed by a pharmacy or by a doctor to their patients. And let's, Thank you. Uh, hey, Dr. Lauhorn, let me um, uh, put a pause at this moment uh, for a couple of uh, reasons. One, um, I think you did a marvelous job uh, explaining the data and really got into the weeds. Uh, for those listening, uh, perhaps uh, maybe you and Dr. Nadeau can take a higher level approach and potentially go through some patient journeys, some clinical vignettes that can highlight what you alluded to, both the uncertainty and the inappropriate attribution of certain deaths when it's not appropriate, specifically when it comes to alcohol abuse or when it comes to a patient who may have been receiving prescription opioids, then no longer received prescription opioids and went on to abusing certain synthetic formularies. I think it's important for people to understand that these patient journeys are quite complex and contribute to the uncertainty. And hopefully you two can speak to that. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of sources we can quote uh, that, that help us to understand how variable the patient journey is. One thing we now know is that over half of U.S. community clinics, uh, I would say that we have evidence of this. I can't say that we absolutely know the exact numbers because they're hard to get our hands on. But we know that there's been a major, um, basically, witch hunt by the USDEA 
against all clinicians who prescribe opioids to their patients. And the consequence of that witch hunt, um, and that's a very strong term, I realize that I don't want to be, you know, completely over the top about this, but I believe it, it applies. The consequence of that is that over half of all community clinics are now refusing to accept pain patients for pain management in this year, right now, today. And that's supported by uh, what are called uh, secret, uh, secret consumer uh, um, surveys that are done in several states. Likewise, there is a major shortage right now, largely because of the DEA restrictions on production, uh, which have dropped in every year for the last eight years. The, uh, the, the DEA actually sets production quotas. And because they've set them too low, uh, many pharmacies are no longer able to get supplies that are adequate for the patient load that they have. And there have been so many doctors who've been driven out of pain management practice that there, another anomaly that sticks up out of the grass is that doctor, a patient may have multiple doctors in a given year because one doctor has retired or gone out of practice for red, excuse me, multiple pharmacies in their records. And every state now keeps records. They're called prescription drug monitoring programs. The consequence of that is that red flags are being identified by pharmacies and they're saying, oh, you've had way too much with the amount of opioids you're being prescribed and you've been seen by more than one pharmacy. I think you're shamming your pain to get drugs to sell in the street. Now that is a quotation. That is a direct quote from someone I've talked to. And I'm seeing representative narratives in social media widely around that subject. Now add to that, even in hospitals, doctors are so gun shy of uh, prescribing opioids for severe terminal pain that they are refusing to, to subscribe even to patients that are known to be terminal and may, and may possibly belong in hospice. Now this I have from multiple patient reports in social media and to me directly. I published uh, one particular vignette on this subject in Reason Magazine a few, a few months ago. A lady by the name of Rhonda Favero, and she doesn't mind having her name used, so we can in this podcast. Rhonda Favero related a, a, a narrative to me. Her, 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 her husband had a brain tumor and it was inoperable and he was in the hospital for a, something on the order of three to four months, uh, dying in front of her eyes and crying because the doctors, as they told her, could not prescribe for him because there was a risk of sanctions from their state medical board or prosecution from the DEA. And this was a terminal patient, known to be terminal, and crying from agony every day. This is not a rare story. It is happening all across the United States. And it is a major crisis in pain care and in the lack of pain care. So we have patient narratives by the thousands. There is also work published in sources like the New York Times opinion page. One of those publishing is Maya Zalovitz. She's an, a long-term and very credible uh, critic of the CDC and its role in the, in the mess that we're facing. Another source on this is, is Jeff, Jeffrey Singer, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He's been writing for years on the interactions between law enforcement and uh, chronic pain patients and addicts. And in, in the, the view of these individuals, we do have a, an opioid crisis in the United States, but it is a crisis of illegal street drugs, not of clinically supplied or managed drugs that are made uh, prescribed to patients. It's just not there. The, the evidence for that is just not there. I hope I've been responsive to your, your question, uh, Jay. And I, I think perhaps Steve can add something around the edges of this. Thank you, Ray. Uh, 
So um, I'm going to try to directly answer your questions, Jay, uh, but also to to simplify uh, if I can. Um, and I'm going to speak to two populations that I may refer I may refer to both as patients. One are clinic patients, patients we're treating for chronic pain, and and the other are uh, addicts to illicit drugs, uh, who in a very real sense are are patients or perhaps not being seen by anybody, any any professional, but but they're people with a, a terrible, terrible uh, psychological um, and other health problems. So first of all, uh, we've known since approximately 2014, uh, a study by Gomes uh, and her colleagues um, uh, supported by others told us that the annual mortality in uh, patients treated in clinics was about 0.25%. Um, can you, um, I apologize, Dr. No, can you specify, are you looking at the left side or the right side, individual drugs, all drugs? The left side here, uh, mortality rate per 100,000. So, so, so we're, we're talking about very, very low very low rates of, of mortality. We have since learned um, that that uh, mortality risk is not spread evenly. It doesn't apply in the same way to all uh, patients followed in clinics, uh, thanks to uh, a, a masterful study by Oliva and her colleagues on actually uh, a large population of veterans. Uh, it turns out that the, the people who are dying of overdoses are, are people with terrible psychiatric problems uh, defined by multiple psychiatric admissions, uh, recurrent suicide attempts, overdose attempts, many of these with inpatient hospitalizations, people who just happen to also have physical pain and are being treated with opioids for that physical pain probably, as we know, undertreated, so that in addition to their psychic pain, they're, they're suffering from physical uh, pain. Uh, the contribution of opioids to the risk of uh, overdose, suicide, or death turns out to be very, very small compared to the, uh, the psychiatric uh, factors. So, that means flipping around that people who uh, have relatively modest psychiatric problems uh, are at essentially no risk at all. Uh, now, I want to return to this graph on the left, and I'm going to focus almost exclusively on the blue line. So you can see that there's a, a dramatic uh, increase in um, deaths between 1999 and um, the year 2011. And it turns out that there are two contributors to that rise in deaths. One is the fact that uh, our attitudes about treating uh, patients with chronic non-cancer pain changed dramatically around the year 2000. So we've got a substantially larger denominator uh, number of people receiving opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. We don't know exactly how many that is, even to this date. Um, but also contributing to this rise is uh, pill mills, uh, corrupt physicians, corrupt pharmacists working in liaison, supplied um, literally uh, hundreds of millions of tablets of uh, opioids of various sorts by the major drug distribution firms like uh, McKesson and Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health, and, and others um, who were perfectly happy to ship these literally semi-loads of pills to the participating pharmacies. Now, between 2000 and 2012, you can see that the curve suddenly flattens out. It stops rising. And so you could ask, well, what the heck happened then? And what happened is that 
after the DEA had failed to rein in the drug distribution firms in the, the late aughts, the states took the, the, the bull by the horns and shut down the pill mills. And we could go into detail on how that occurred, but I don't think it's necessary for the argument. And you can see the dramatic effect that shutting down the pill mills had on uh, the, the rates of opioid deaths related to prescription opioids um, once the pill mills were out of business. So, so that really tells us that the pill mills were responsible for much of this precipitous uh, rise. Now, before I leave the 1999 to 2011 curve, uh, I want to make one more point, and that is uh, this, this is the portion of the curve that the CDC always seizes upon to make their case that prescription opioids caused the uh, opioid crisis. Um, the CDC, even its 2022 guidelines revision, uh, didn't even mention pill mills. They failed to recognize it. And most scientists in the field uh, have really not said much about pill mills, clearly indicating they don't understand the role that they played in this, this catastrophe. So after 11, we follow the curve, then we start to see uh, a rise in 2013. Now, what does that represent? Well, here we're going back to your the trajectories of individual patients, Jay. Um, so uh, we don't know the precise epidemiology of this population, but we can infer, infer it from a number of statistics and signs caused by uh, a number of things. But but I, I think the, the dominant factors are what I call crossovers. So who are the crossovers? Well, there are two, there are two groups of people. One is patients who have des who are desperate with pain, um, absolutely cannot live their lives with, with this extraordinary uh, level of pain. Pain caused by the CDC, which has limited the uh, doses of drugs that they can get. Um, and so they opt to either commit suicide or to cross over to the illicit market um, and use illicit drugs, which is to say drugs like fentanyl and fentanyl because of its enormous potency, 100 times that of morphine, 50 times that of heroin, fentanyl is going to mean uh, death sooner or later without any, without any uh, question. Um, but because these patients were prescribed opioids within the year prior to death, these deaths will be labeled prescription opioid deaths, when actually they were polypharmacy deaths, and most importantly, fentanyl deaths. There are crossovers the other way. So we know from a Massachusetts study published, goodness, might be eight years ago now, that there are people who mainly use illicit drugs, uh, but uh, may uh, cross over to the clinic to achieve an additional source of opioid, uh, a, a very safe source, um, but uh, and because they receive an opioid prescription, uh, sometime during the year prior to death, they're labeled as prescription opioid deaths, um, even if they haven't had that prescription refill for many months, indicating clearly prescription opioids had no role at all in their deaths, um, they're still labeled opioid deaths. So I think that's what we're seeing there. So the, the rise here is is a really of current uh, policies, uh, our failure to address the crisis and chronic pain that the CDC has created, so getting people crossing over to the illicit uh, market and our complete failure to deal with uh, patients uh, who are addicted to now uh, illicit drugs. Um, Steve, may I add something? Mm -hmm. There's a complicating factor in exactly the phenomenon you're reporting. Uh, prior to about 2017, U.S. CDC was accumulating data on fentanyl and labeling all fentanyl-related deaths 
they got caught at it and they admitted that they had overreported prescription uh, deaths for some years. But as far as I've ever seen, they were never able to go back into their data sets and unravel the misreporting that, that they were guilty of. So CDC itself contributed to the um, apparent significance of this curve by misreporting illegal fentanyl and death related to illegal fentanyl as prescription related. And they were they had nothing to do with prescriptions in many cases. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important point. I'm going to conclude just with one brief further remark. And, and that is going back first to the blue curve, this sudden flattening out, which corresponds to um, the states shutting down the pill mills. Um, when they shut down the pill mills, uh, patients addicted to these quote unquote prescription opioids, actually pill mill opioids, found themselves with no drug supply. Um, and it was at this point that Mexican and Chinese entrepreneurs um, selling heroin and fentanyl um, jumped into the market. And that's why we see uh, th these four curves, which also include cocaine and methamphetamine, that after right, right about in here, at 2012, uh, when the supply of licit opioids provided by pill mills dried up, we see this skyrocketing, rocketing reflected in the, the four <coughs> curves uh, below, uh, corresponding to heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cocaine. Uh, but again, the, the, the uh, Ochre line corresponding to fentanyl um, has the most precipitous rise, uh, an exponential rise. And that's because fentanyl has played a special role in causing deaths by virtue of its enormous potency. It is said that an amount of fentanyl that uh, is equivalent to about five grains of salt is, will be fatal. So we're talking tiny, tiny quantities. So if the, the street um manufacturer puts the equivalent of six grains of salt in whatever that concoction is, whether it's a pill or, or an IV injection, the person who uses it is dead. Um, and that's why this precipitous rise in fentanyl uh, deaths and why the illicit opioid crisis these days is really a crisis of fentanyl. Yeah. Uh, Red, real quickly before we begin, I want to just uh, expand on what you had mentioned uh, regarding the uh, CDC overcounting. Um, uh, specifically, on January 1st, 2016, in a morbidity and mortality weekly report, the CDC, and I will include this article in the video description, acknowledged in a op-ed by Rudd et al. that they were misrepresenting fentanyl and that they included that in the total number of prescription opioid deaths. And so I will include that paper in for everybody's edification. That's very helpful. I just wish they had ever bothered to go back and try to unravel the original data sources, but they claim not to be able to do that because the data sources were accumulated state by state. And they would have had to pay for and didn't have the money to pay for uh, tasking the state um, reporting organizations to actually go back and redo the statistics. They never they never got around to that somehow. And that, to some extent, I think, reflects a significant political bias on the part of the CDC. That being said, um, there is one more chart that I think we can present that is also uh, very germane here, if we can. And this is a chart that I will claim responsibility for because Back in 2016 or 17, I ran into a chart very much like this one in, of all places, Twitter. And it was written, the chart at that time was written to, um, or written by a business analyst who had no medical credentials, who just got curious about the National Cause of Death database which is maintained and accessed through CDC Wonder. CDC Wonder is the CDC's uh, 
database on um, uh, drug-related deaths of all kinds. And when I saw the chart that was circulating in Twitter, I went back to the author of it, and his name is John Allen Tucker. And I said, hey, this looks like extremely interesting stuff. Help me understand it. And here's basically what he told me. He said he went back state by state to understand the relationship of two things. One was deaths per 100,000 population in which an opioid of some kind was believed to be the, the primary cause of death. And the other was the number of prescriptions of an opioid per 100 population. And this is startling when you look at the results state by state. There are 50 points plus the DC, actually 51 points because DC is also in, represented here on this chart. And it looks like the blast of a shotgun against the barn door. And what it basically says is that there was a very high volume in 2016. That's, that's the line across the top of the chart that says where this is from. There was a very large number of prescriptions, even in that year, after they had dropped significantly. And we were uh, prescribing something between 40 or so and 120 or so prescriptions per 100 people in the United States. A population that varied in that year, there was about 240,000 adults and something on the order of 325 million, excuse me, 240 million adults and 300 and roughly 325 million people overall. So what you see is variation in the number of prescriptions per 100 population that varies over a factor of three from one U.S. state to another. And then in deaths per 100,000 population, it varies from a little bit less than 10 per 100,000 to as high in one instance as 50 per 100,000. And that little red line that runs through this chart, that's the trend line. <laughs> the trend line tells us that it's flat. It also tells us that there is enormous variation from U.S. state to U.S. state, some of which is probably related to uncertainty. We've got to give that, you know, make that acknowledgement. The sources for this chart are quoted below, and I think anybody who wants to can go back and duplicate this process. The number of prescriptions per 100 population was from U.S. CDC prescribing rate maps that they also published and the original sources footnoted on this chart. And what this chart tells us is that there is no relationship between the number of prescriptions that are dispensed per 100 population in any given state versus the number of deaths per 100 population in that state. There's no relationship that we can reliably rely on or reliably quote at all. And much more fundamental to this is that the U.S. CDC knew it. They had to have known it in order to acknowledge the misapplication of their, their attribution of fentanyl deaths. They had to. They knew there was no relationship, and yet they wrote a guideline that claimed one. And they continue to assort, assert a relationship between prescribing by clinicians and deaths due to the opioid overdose. There is no such relationship. There is no cause and effect here. And data like this, year by year, prove it. Red, let's, um, let's talk about two key points here. One, uh, a relatively quick uh, data-oriented question that really for my own um, learning as well when we look at Aubrey and we compare that with the CDC mapping here, there is a, you know, there's a particular correlation that I'm just curious to see. Do you believe that the data on this graph here correlates to what you see in Aubrey, where you see the prescription number of opioid deaths remaining as a flat line as well, which is the opioid prescription deaths POD? Does that data correspond? Not entirely, especially not after 2016. And it's not absolutely clear why, but I've gone through uh, 
the report that he generated on frontiers in, in uh, he and, and Tom Carr uh, generated on frontiers in, in pain research. And they did download the data directly from CDC sources. And so from that perspective, beyond 2016, which I might add is the end of the, the data set that Howery uh, Jalal and his colleagues looked at because they looked at the, the line to the, to the right, left of the vertical black line. This is not the only source that reports a relatively steady year-by-year uh, -year, uh, progression of um, opioid-related deaths. There's also another excellent paper by Michael Shatman, um, Jeffrey Singer and and I believe Jake Sullum. Uh, Jake is a, 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 a healthcare editor for Reason Magazine. So the the flat line is supported by other sources than R N and uh, Aubrey. Uh, it, it is reported from multiple sources. It it is a reliable number, and it basically says uh, the 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 rate of um, deaths from opioid prescribing seems to reflect a very small subset of all patients who are uh, prescribed opioids for pain. And that small subset is down in the range of something like 15,000 deaths per year. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if we were using uncertainty bounds, this red line would be a red band because there is considerable uh, uncertainty in the data themselves that were processed to generate it. I hope I'm being responsive to your to your question. If you want to amplify, please feel free. No, I, certainly, I this is very helpful, in, Dr. Nadeau. I'll just jump in very briefly. When when the the Aubrey and Carr paper came out, it actually reproduced uh, data and trends that that. Red and I had already developed, and Red's talked about that today, but did it in a much more uh, refined scientific analysis. It was gratifying to see that uh, our cruder approaches were uh, replicated in a really uh, robust uh, statistical fashion. I would also say that uh, the curves in Aubrey and Carr correspond quite nicely to uh, the point I was making earlier, that between 2000, what they found is between 2000 and 2010, there there was a uh, steep rise in prescription opioid deaths, which we now know for certain was related to pill mill distribution of uh, opioids. And then once the pill mills have been shut down between 2010 and, and when the end of their analysis, which I think was 16, 16, 16 uh, with the pill mills shut down, um, uh, it was a flat curve. There, there was there was no relationship between number of prescriptions and number of deaths. So, so theirs was a, in my mind, a robust confirmation of uh, the understanding we'd already uh, arrived at as to the contributors to. Uh, prescription opioid uh, uh, mortality, using the term prescription uh, uh, loosely to include two categories, prescriptions by conscientious physicians, which made no important contribution, and prescriptions by pill mills, which drove the modern crisis. Let's, let's uh, continue that thought, Steve, together. Um, Again, relating this back to the red curve on the bottom of this thing, it says that the number of deaths directly attributable to a, an opioid, a prescription opioid, not necessarily an opioid that was prescribed by a doctor. Now, remember the distinction. By all opioid prescriptions, both legitimate and diverted, the number of deaths is something on the order of 15,000 per year. But let's compare that to the number of prescriptions. The number of prescriptions in a given year uh, in the, the various states 
are like 40 to 140 prescriptions per adult. Now there are three, there are something on the order of three, of 240 million adults. And we are seeing about 15,000 opioids that, uh, excuse me, deaths that are attributed to prescription opioids over this period. And what this should tell us is that the gross risk, or at least the, the median gross risk, is thousandths of a percent. The incidence of death attributable, attributable to prescription opioids is so small in the overall population that we can't measure it accurately. It is literally vanishingly small. Red, let's let's touch on that point because I think that's important. Um, a couple of things. Um, why do you use median instead of mean? Why do you differentiate prescription opioids as intended to be prescribed versus diverted? And then talk about the magnitude about how it being so small, it cannot be reliably measured relative to the other data. Okay, what we're seeing here, uh, for, first of all, we know that um, there are some diverted uh, pharmaceutical opioids still circulating in the street. It's fairly small numbers now. During the pill mill era, there were a lot of them. Uh, probably out of the gross volume, if you will, out of the, the uh, MME per capita in any given year, probably, I'm guessing here, something on the order of a quarter to possibly as much as a, as a half were circulating from pill mills the mortality figures don't reflect it. And that's important because pharmaceutical grade fentanyl doped or counterfeit pills aren't. So what we have here is a rising overdose death, that's the, the top red curve, due to fentanyl and, to, and in some part due to patients being forced into illegal markets, frankly. But we have a flat level of death relative to um, overall figures that are directly attributable to opioids themselves. So what's happened is the difference between the two red curves, top and bottom, is basically, uh, Martin, I just was a little bit interrupted. Let me back up a half sec. The difference between the bottom and top curves is illegal opioids either diverted uh, from um, regular sources, and that's relatively small because the DEA has admitted they've never been able to trace more than about 2% of prescription opioids in diversionary channels. Yeah. Or we also have the evidence here that there's really no great difference between median and mean. Median says that half the population, if you knew what it was, is above a certain point and half is below a certain point. So mean is just the average that most of us use when, when we're talking about averaging information points. This is, I'm not doing a very terribly great job of this. Maybe uh, Stephen can amplify, but the bottom line in this chart is uh, Aubrey and Carr downloaded show us that opioid prescription related deaths are relatively constant throughout the period 2010 to 2019. And that is pretty much confirmed by data that, that uh, Howry and Jalal uh, reported for prescription-related opioids after you take out the over-reporting that was, was the result of CDC just not doing their job very well. That's fairly consistent. Hospital admissions trend upward, and in some years they're relatively flat. And there's a lot of uncertainty around hospital admissions, the, cur the uh, uh, blue curve, because admissions in which treatment for an opioid was one factor probably included a whole lot of other treatments, including alcohol poisoning, of all things, which is supposed to be reported separately and sometimes isn't. Emergency rooms get real busy. So there is a lot of ambiguity in the curves, a lot of uncertainty in the curves. Um, Bottom line, though, is what this curve and the splatter chart that you saw just a little bit ago demonstrate to us is that there is no consistent cause and effect relationship between 
the rates of prescribing of opioids and opioid related mortality it is not there and in the in the curve that Howery et al sent to us what or, uh, shared with us what they showed was that basically the attribution of opioid of, of medical opioids of prescription opioids has never been more than about 25% of total deaths involving an opioid of some kind and that tends to get lost in the noise street drugs have been driving this issue for the last 23 years uh, excuse me well yes for the last 23 years street drugs largely have been driving the issue even though it is clear that pill mills have contributed their contribution was never conclusive well said now that we're coming about the one hour approach uh I'd like to maybe circle it back to both of you for some additional concluding thoughts, and then we can Jake, certainly can consider this. one point here? Sure. So this just occurred to me as Brad was talking, and I want to focus on the bottom red line here, which is prescription op opioids. And um, as in so many cases, a simple line on a graph uh, often holds many truths. So buried in this line is actually uh, what Oliva and her colleagues told us um, in their published study in 2017 or 18. So um, these are patients, this bottom line. They're all patients. Uh, so their entire source of drug, uh, for the most part, is prescription opioids. Now, if prescription opioids were an important contributor to their deaths, um, then uh, we would have seen that line decline um, over those years, uh, but we don't. And what that tells us is, is that they weren't dying because in, in any significant numbers because of prescription opioids. They were dying of the problems that Oliva and her colleagues uh, identified, namely uh, overwhelming psychiatric disease. Um, with the addition of some physical pain as well. If opioids had been uh, an important contributor, then the tremendous contraction of uh, uh, opioid prescriptions for clinic populations would have resulted in a, in a downward uh, slope of this curve. Now, 2016 is when the CDC guideline came out. Uh, pharmacies across the country were exerting more and more pressure uh, to uh, prevent patients from getting uh, filling their prescription opioids. And the term pharmacy crawl was coined, I think, in 2012 to describe patients who had a pre prescription from a physician that might have been following them for years and years and pharmacist after pharmacist would refuse to fill the prescription. So the, the downward uh, pressure on prescription opioids started uh, long before uh, the CDC stepped in, probably around 2011-2012. So this bottom line here really um, is a, a, a hint of what we'll leave it all for to discover uh, years later. Let me add something to this. Could we go back to the chart from uh, Jalal? Yep. Uh, this is a nuance that is really, really important from a legal standpoint. You want to be aware of where I first discovered this chart. It was referred to me by um, Larry Aubrey, who had done the statistical work that I, we mentioned earlier. And you'll never guess where he found it. He found it in a presentation that was made by the Diversion Control Division of the US DEA. They published this information to uh, an audience of clinicians in 2020. They knew of it at least as early as 2019 because the report itself from Jalal was published in 2018 in science. So the USDEA has known for at least the last four to five years that prescription opioids do not comprise a dominant 
uh, fraction of the exponential curve that we see on the right. They've known that. They've known that prescription drugs never drove this crisis. And yet, all during the last four years, they've continued to prosecute doctors for prescribing outside of the bounds of reasonable and customary practice. They've continued with asset confiscations before trial. They've continued with assertions that the prescribing uh, rates in somehow that are detected in prescription drug monitoring programs are red flags, which they aren't in many cases. So the DEA has been effectively engaging in a public campaign of fraud, and they know it. This chart is the smoking gun that should prompt a judicial review of every drug conviction against a doctor in the last five years. Every one. Because doctors have been denied the opportunity to defend themselves on the grounds of the science. And this represents the science that the DEA knows about and ignored. That's really seminal. And so from the perspective of doctors, including you, Jay, uh, because you went through all kinds of, of uh, hassle with all of these issues, any doctor who has been denied the opportunity to defend themselves on the basis of the science that Jalal and, and his contemporaries have surveyed and that I have surveyed and that uh, Aubrey and Carr have surveyed and reported, anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to present that data as a contradiction to the testimony of so-called expert witnesses that DEA hired and paid to tell their story, that person should be essentially released from prison immediately and granted damages for fraud because fraud was worked against them by the DEA itself. Now that's a very hard position, but it is one that I very much hope that legal firms throughout the United States take on as a point of departure for filing for uh, release of prisoners on grounds of, of uh, prosecutorial misbehavior and, and uh, malicious prosecution. That would com conclude my input. If you want to add, Steve, mm -hmm. go ahead, but Jay will turn it back to you. No, I uh, certainly appreciate the constant learning and insight from both of you. I think that this definitely warrants uh, further conversation and hopefully we can have that again in the coming weeks. Uh, I'll put this very simply, and we put it in a paper that was, I just received the galleys uh, this morning, uh, two opioid crises. Um, one is an evolved crisis that uh, began uh, in the late 70s uh, as a population that I call a population left behind, uh, people who saw uh, increasing unemployment uh, because of uh, shipping of jobs overseas, automation, industries like coal uh, uh, becoming uh, losing to competition from other sources or coal going to basically strip mining of mountains rather than uh, courageous men going down into holes in the earth. Um, many communities uh, saw a tremendous decline in religion, which is uh, a source of succor to people, but also of companionship. Uh, they saw a drying up of unions, which, yeah, they, they played a huge role in defending workers' rights. Uh, but also, it's, uh, it's uh, a night at the bar with the boys. Um, all of that disappeared. Families were breaking up, more and more single people, divorced people. Um, uh, physical disability uh, was accumulating often uh, from occupational sources, so these people were unemployable. And uh, most importantly, they were uh, relatively poorly educated, certainly less than college education, but many less than a high school education. So they saw the very fabric of their lives uh, disintegrating, um, and they turned to oblivion provided by opioids and other drugs. Uh, to achieve uh, temporary respite. This is this is the opioid crisis in a in a nutshell, uh, and 
our approach as, as a nation, and actually as a world with the single exception of Portugal, um, have been uh, truly feckless and uh, I've estimated, extrapolating from the Portuguese experiment, that uh, it would cost this country about $6 billion a year to uh, maintain uh, the kind of rehabilitation infrastructure that was necessary to really uh, bring an end to this, what I call, evolved opioid crisis. The other crisis is a manufactured one. It didn't exist before uh, about 2010. Um, when pharmacies began to resist filling prescriptions, and then it was capped by the CDC with their guidelines, so-called, in 2016, that created uh, a huge population uh, among the 15 to 20 million Americans in moderate to severe chronic pain, uh, people who are now suffering horribly to the point they're committing suicide or going to, to the street. So the the manufactured crisis, the crisis that for which the CDC bears special responsibility, uh, that's fixable. The CDC needs to get out of our clinics, uh, leave care of these complicated patients to the professionals. Um, it needs to disavow um, its uh, two um, guideline documents, which we now know are completely politically motivated. There's there's no good science in either of those documents. So we, we kind of know the outlines of the solutions to these two things. And the, the manufacturing crisis is, is, is it, the, the source is eminently solvable. The problem is that the, the CDC has um, disseminated so many false memes about opioids that uh, now everybody believes it. Uh, other scientists, uh, physicians, uh, the lay public, uh, journal reviewers, uh, and journal editors, they now all believe those uh, uh, nonsensical CDC uh, assertions, making it very, very hard to publish papers that even start to question the CDC assertion. So we understand now two crises. We understand um, the, the solutions, uh, both having huge political components. Um, uh, and certainly the uh, uh, solving the evolved crisis is going to require major national uh, and state and local police community um, buy-in uh, in order to make it happen. I'll add to that, if I may. I think it was your intention, uh, Jay. The opioid crisis, as Steve describes it, is a crisis, first of all, of misdirected public policy. The United States has been straining at knots and swallowing Campbell's since 1970, if not since 1870. We have criminalized the conditions that economic disparity and wealth inequality have created. We're dealing with a crisis in hopelessness, not in medical or even in illegal supplies. Now, here is the, the kicker from my perspective, which is complementary to that of uh, Dr. Nado. The U.S. CDC knew when they published in 2016 and when they revised in 2022 their guidelines. And the Veterans Administration should have known when they published in last year in a derivative guideline that the science didn't support the positions that they were taking. Indeed, the, the, it looks very much like these two organizations published simply to defend their own reputations. And they published knowing that what, they were, <laughs> what they were publishing would be a direct source of death and destruction in patient communities that number in the millions. These organizations must be removed from the practice of pain medicine and of evidence-based medicine generally. That position is supported by over 630,000 
U.S. clinicians and medical students in six major professional organizations. It was it was published in 2017 by the American Academy of, Fa of Family Practitioners, excuse me, or Family Physicians, and by five other major uh, uh, professional groups. To put this in the vernacular, CDC lied. They knew they lied. The DEA has lied, and they knew they lied. And it is time for them to get out of Dodge. Both must be removed by legislation from any policymaking role that relates to the treatment of pain or addiction. And if we're going to deal with the addiction problems, we've got a much larger context that we're going to have to address. I think that sums it up pretty well. And on that note, with the crescendo provided by Dr. Lauhern, <laughs> I want to thank both Red and Steve for your time, and we will certainly continue the conversation moving forward. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Jay.